And I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. Like, where? how am I gonna do, what am I gonna do here? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> the admin's like, oh, here comes in the good kisser. That is so well said, because you're rereading, you're like, what the hell was I thinking with this sentence? Hi, y'all. Welcome to Hustle Humbly. It's Alyssa and Katie, and we are two top producing realtors in the Baton Rouge market. We work for two different companies where we should be competitors, but we have chosen community over competition. The goal of our podcast is to encourage you to find your own way in business. So stop comparing yourself and start embracing your strengths. Hi, Alyssa. Hey, Katie. It's episode 138. Okay. We have a special guest. (gasps) This is our first celebrity guest. I know. It's a big deal. It's and a, we, Jason's <laughs> laughing because he's like, it's not that serious. Yeah. It is a big deal. It is a big deal to us, especially because we are Bachelor fans. Yeah. Okay. So Jason, tell the people who you are so that they can get excited with us. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me. My name is uh, Jason Tardick. I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, was a corporate banker before I took a wild detour and went on that show called The Bachelorette. And I finished uh, third on season. I always joke around, got the bronze medal. Third on uh, on uh, Becca's season, and that was season uh, 14, I believe. And then as a result of that, there was a couple of us up for discussion about being the next Bachelor, and they decided to go with Colton Underwood. And so uh, Caitlin That's Bristol- pretty funny. Yeah, a former bachelorette came out to Seattle and was doing some interviewing for a podcast. And Caitlin, uh, you know, interviewed me to just say what's next. And ironically enough, what was next was right in front of me. And I'm engaged now to Caitlin Bristow. We live in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, yeah, we are right in the heart, a dead center epicenter of Bachelor Nation. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. They like flock to that area. Yeah. Yeah. Na- it seems like right now, Nashville, New York, Chicago, LA is like the predominant. And now actually a lot of people are going to Texas. You're seeing a lot of like Bachelor Nation people go to like Austin. Austin. Yeah. yeah. I that think Chris sense. Harrison and uh, Chris I Harrison saw that. and Zuma I did just see moved that. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. All right. So let's kind of maybe also tell our audience about what you do now, what what your job is, what your business is, and how you kind of help your community. For sure. So there's there's actually a little bit of a story behind it. But for you know nine years, almost 10 years almost, I was a corporate banker. I relocated four times. My longest and, and, and biggest move was from New York to Seattle. I moved to Seattle not knowing one human for a promotion. And I got seven promotions. I was the yes guy. You tell me where to go, how to go, I'm going to do it. You tell me to get my MBA at night, I'll do it. I was that guy until I burnt out. And inevitably, uh, if you're not listening to kind of like your inner voice and, and yourself within your business and your construct of who you are, uh, you too might burn out. And I went on the show, The Bachelorette, against uh, the approval of every person uh, in my corner. My friends, my family, they're like, dude, what are you doing? You got a rocket ship on your back. Why are you doing this? And I'm like, you know what? For the first time in 10 years, I'm doing something because I want to do it, even though it's not the logical blueprint thing to do. So I completely broke the blueprint. Went back to corporate America and a story that I tell in my book, which is now out for pre-sale, it's called The Restart Roadmap, uh, that I really haven't told many people is that after a year of working back for the bank, Caitlin made a PG-13 rated type comment and one of her confessions about our relationship. It hit some of the headlines. And this was literally the first, the first bump I really had with this company in 10 years. And they put me in this ultimate ultimatum, which was you either have to restart your career at the bank. And if you do that, no more side hustle, no more social media, no more podcast, eliminate it all. Or you can go restart yourself outside of the bank. And so I chose to go restart myself outside the bank. And not only did I choose to do that, but I created a company called Restart to really help people refine their career tracks and restart themselves, uh, both from a career management perspective and a career um, and a personal liter- financial literacy perspective. And under that Restart umbrella, we have built a lot of different entities in the business, which is uh, you know making an impact on over a, a million eyeballs a week, which is exciting. That is amazing. One thing I really like about your podcast in general is that you're always very transparent about numbers and logistics of how things worked. When you were making these changes, were you just living off of savings? Like how how were you able to survive during the transition periods and starting up everything? 
For sure. Yeah. So the podcast, it's called Trading Secrets. And that's like one of the the many different prongs under Restart. And like you said, one of the big things we do is we talk about money, myself and our guests. We talk about our wins or losses because behind every dollar earned or lost, there's usually a really good story that goes with it. But we have this theory that we're trying to crack that in society, it's uh, it's not a societal norm to talk about money. It is a no-no. It's shunned away when really when we talk about it, if we do it in a healthy way, Way, it's such a good way for us to learn more so we can all navigate our lives accordingly. But for me, I had, uh, and I, I talk about this in my book, you know, 10 years of working pretty hard. Well, the reason I went to Seattle before the show is I was, I was 29 and I got a signing bonus. It was $110,000. My base was $165,000. And then I had upside to more than potentially double the base on the, the, the output within that role. So I knew if I stayed I did all the math. I knew if I stayed there for two years, I already had going into it, I already had my uh, MBA debt taken care of and my undergrad debt paid off. So I knew that for two years, based on like my budgeting plan, I would be indebted to the bank. I would have, I'm sorry, I would have no debt to the bank. So because they, what they do with these signing bonuses, they keep you on. So after two years, all that debt was clear. I wouldn't know anything in the bank. And if I budgeted accordingly, I'd have the financial freedom to go do with what I wanted because I knew by the time I went to Seattle, my time was running low and I was burning out. So when I transitioned over to uh, what I'm doing now, all my entrepreneurship, I was actually double dipping for one full year. So what I call the double dipping year is I was pursuing all my entrepreneurship and opportunities and speaking and events and sponsorships and building this small business as I was still working full time. And by the time it all came to a head and I had to end up leaving the bank, um, I was actually in a much better financial position than I even anticipated uh, as part of my plan when I first moved to Seattle. Okay. So that makes perfect sense. And when a lot of agents get into real estate as a second career, so a lot of times it's the same as what you're talking about. They try to figure out, well, how long can I stay in my full-time job and still do this basically as my side hustle that I'm planning to move towards in the future? And um, so I think there's a lot of parallels in the logistics of that. Yeah. What kind of advice would you give to someone who is in a current full-time, maybe a corporate type job, and then they're they're working towards going into something else, like how long or, or just general advice on that transition. Yeah, that especially with real estate, right? Because as a residential uh, real estate agent, it's kind of like you eat what you kill. So you're not living off this like cushy base. And so I do think uh, creating that type of runway for yourself is huge. But as you guys know, in that business, it's like a slow snowball, right? It takes a long time to get that snowball going. But once you do, you've created referral sources and a business and credibility and a brand, and it just starts coming to you and you don't have to so much go for it. But in that beginning, part when you are starting out it is going to take insane discipline and this is with anything this is even with a podcast this is literally with any new venture it's going to take insane discipline it's going to take ultimate consistency that is a must and it's going to take really tactful strategic moves and because you only have now this goes two ways you have 168 hours in a week. That's a whole hell of a lot. But you only have 168 hours in a week. And you have to take care of yourself and, and personal matters as well. So you have to be very tactful with how you're building your business. And the two things that I think most people don't do is they're not consistent with how they do what they're doing. And they're not disciplined in making sure they're getting done what they have to get done to get where they want to be. I agree with that so much. And it's funny because I started real estate when I was 21 and I'm 33 now. Mm -hmm. When I was 21, I looked like I was 14. And so <laughs> even now when new agents come into our industry and they say, but how do you do what you're doing? And I tell them I'm on year 11, you know, I'm going into year 12. This, I am not where you are. And when I was where you are, I was hustling and I was working as much as I could for free a lot of times, just trying to learn and train. And the answer that you just gave is the answer that I give. And it is not the answer that people like. No, <laughs> they want the secret. Yeah, they want the secret. What's the secret? Yeah, they think that you are where you are because of some magic formula or something that I do every every day, but they, they don't typically like the answer that it takes time. It takes discipline. It takes saving your money and having a plan. I think that answer is very overwhelming to people. And that is why the success 
ratio is so small. Let's tell Jason because he probably doesn't know. What is this? So, yeah. Yes. So three out of 10 people who get mm-hmm. licensed as a realtor make it to year three. Three. Year three. Yeah. So 70% fail. Wow. 70% fail by year three. And what's crazy is so many people, I think, are doing their restart because of COVID. Sure. Um, and just the changes in the world. In the last two years, so 2020 and 2021, 180,000 people in the United States have gotten their real estate license. Wow. <laughs> is that the, it's, it's like way more than anyone has ever. So now there's over 1.5 million realtors in the United States. Oh my gosh. That is a fun fact I did not know. And you think about that burnout rate. That's the same thing you see in some large corporate. Even we're now seeing it in a lot of professional type industries like doctors and dentists and things like that. You're seeing it all over. You think about what could be done today? What could be done right now to proactively prepare yourself to not be one of those burnouts? And people just don't do enough due diligence in what they want to do or how they're going to do it or have a conversation with people like you before they go in. And think about the time that's wasted when you've deployed effort, money, resources, and your personal life to something that you know isn't the right fit. And I just think so many people out there have to start being more proactive with due diligence before they start say, oh, real estate it sounds fun. I saw that my buddy just made 70 grand on one big commission. There's more to that story. Right. And you got to do it. You got to do that due diligence. The barrier to entry to become a, a real estate agent is very low. low. It's a simple test. You could take the course online in three weeks and now you're licensed. But people don't often think past that. Okay, now I'm licensed. Now what? Do I just have business? There is no salary. Where are you going to get the business? And so the I agree that the planning of what's next, people aren't thinking long term. They're just thinking in the moment of, I need to do something. This is the quickest and the easiest thing, but they don't realize what it takes. And what's funny about it being a fail ratio of 70% in the first three years is that year three is when you finally start getting your momentum of repeat and referral. And people are like, wow, that person is here to stay as a realtor. They have been working all these years. I think they actually have some credibility now. And it seems like just when people get on that edge, they quit. But in the same note, we always say that your year countdown doesn't start until you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So if you've been a realtor for five years, but you haven't been putting in the work, building your database, hosting the open houses, reaching out to your clients, like you have to start doing that now. And now your three-year clock begins. It's not like you can just sit back for three years. Yeah, it doesn't automatically come. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think one story I have too that connects uh, to exactly what you just said and the story is both encouraging and discouraging, however perceived. It was the Great. worst interview I've ever had on Trading Secrets. So I'm going to put that out there. I hate to bash them, but it was the worst interview I had. But this was a story I'll still never forget. I'm wondering was, if I listened to it because I... <laughs> Well, it hasn't, like, been, it hasn't been released. I don't even know if I can release it. That's how what? bad. What? But it was that with, in what way? Um, so it was with Josh Flagg. And Josh Flagg, for anybody in the real estate business, is on Bravo's Million Dollar Listing. Uh, He needs an extremely successful resident, luxury, LA-based residential uh, real estate uh, agent who has done over, uh, you know, a half billion dollars in deals. Mm -hmm. So extremely successful. But uh, the reason it wasn't a great interview is because. Josh is very confident in who he is. And I don't know that um, uh, trading his career and money tactics and secrets are really his forte. And I'll give you an example. And I think anybody that's listening to this, that's considering the business or in the business could take something away from it. But I said to him, I said, Josh, listen, Forbes 30 under 30, you've, you've done over half billion dollars in de- uh, deals. You're, you're literally the top, one of the top brokers in the entire planet. Like people are going to listen to this and they're going to look up to your success and they're going to want to find something they can replicate, something they could take away to potentially do it themselves. What type of advice would you have for them? And he just kind of like paused. He was like looking all over. It's like, my advice would be don't get in the business. It's just like that. 
<laughs> I was like, okay, don't, no, so like no like uh, inspiration or insight. No, okay, um, just don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Yeah. Why though, it. Josh? Why? What's you know? What's the deal here? And Josh says, well, here's the deal. There's just no way to replicate me because there's only one me, and no one will ever be as good as me. It's like, okay, I all right, I respect that. Let's drill down further. Josh, why are you so good? Like, tell, explain to me your answer. And what he simply said in very simple words was, there's not one human in the planet that will know my market better than me. Every street I know, every single, every single piece of property, I know the person, I know the family, I know who owned it, I know what it's going for. And he was pretty much saying, that's my differentiating factor. So don't okay. try and be me because you'll never be me. And I yeah, think that's, that's encouraging, right? It's encouraging, but it's also discouraging. The encouraging part, I think, with that is if you are a real estate agent, you better damn well find out what is your Josh flag? What is your differentiator that can that can separate you from the 1.5 million? And I don't, if you can't identify that, I think that process becomes even tougher and longer to see that window of success. I would agree. That's a great story because the funny part of that is what he told you was the reason is anyone can learn information. Mm -hmm. right. it, it wasn't it wasn't about his personality type or his like process. It was literally nope. I know things. Well, anyone can know things. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can learn. You can learn that. Anyone can learn. And we talk about that a lot on the show that if you're not willing to just literally learn the market, you're never going to have confidence. You're never going to have information that that makes your clients feel comfortable working with you. So, yeah, we always say like confidence is key, but that only comes from training, learning, the more knowledgeable you are, you just all of a sudden radiate confidence because you've done it before, which sometimes can come with experience and effort. Yeah. But anybody could really get there. Oh, for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I selfishly Absolutely. don't want you to release that interview now so that we can have like a little <laughs> behind the scenes. Uh, like that's it. so that's so funny. Okay. So one of the focuses of our show is to stop comparing yourself and to start kind of embracing who you are and your strengths, which kind of plays into that that story. What was your experience like with comparison at your corporate job and kind of how did that affect you and how does that affect you now? I mean, even being in, in the field you're in now as an entrepreneur, there's still comparison. For sure. I think the problem with most of my career in corporate banking is I was so focused. And this is one of my biggest regrets is I cared too much about what people thought. And I was trying to... Uh, look a certain way, speak a certain way, act a certain way, work a certain way. And that way was the way I thought other people identified what success looked like. So rather than just being me, rather than talking in my tone, rather than dressing and appearing the way I thought made sense, I was always trying to customize it to what I thought success would be in the eyes of the, the, the person in front of me. The issue with that is you're staying so high level with everything, you're never really building a true connection. You're not building a true relationship because human connection is based on vulnerability, shared experiences, being real, being authentic, being genuine. And when you're continuing to put on this front, you're really not impressing anyone. And if anything, you are putting a roadblock in front of your success to truly build relationships. Um, but the whole, I think, imposter syndrome is a real thing, right? Like impairing yourself and, and maybe losing confidence because of what you see around you. Uh, and I felt that a lot of times in corporate America. And I, you know, even I talk about this in the book, I felt imposter syndrome when I walked right through the doors of that bachelor mansion. I mean, I'm walking in the door <laughs> as confident as I could be based on you know my friend group and my little circle out of Buffalo and Rochester, New York. I'm doing okay for myself. And all of a sudden I look around and every single guy is, you know, six foot four, jacked out of their mind. Then I start talking to them and I'm like, so what's your story? Oh, NFL player, Harlem Globetrotter, MLB player, MLS player. We had a freaking, we had the fourth employee of Venmo, the one of the founders of Venmo. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. And their stories just keep getting like crazy. You know, Colton's like a Ken Barbie doll, 6'4", beautiful guy, football player. Then he drops on me. He's a virgin. I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Like, where? Yeah. how am I going to do? What am I going to do bring here? bring in the unicorn. Yeah. Right? Like, what the heck? And so I think uh, through all those experiences, what I've learned is you really have to do self-examination right down to the bedrock of who you are. And I it know, goes back to- Is this Pino or Ramen that's looking at us? I need to know. Oh, that's Ramen right 
right there. Hi, Ramen. Look at that. Look at him, <laughs> look at him modeling. Hey, Ramen. He's totally modeling. No, puppy yeah. girl. You're part modeling. of the podcast now, buddy. Yeah. Love it. Good oh, look, boy. He's back. He's like, okay. That um, was a cameo. We had a cameo. Now, now that is now so ch- funny. Now he's wagging his tail and wants attention. I love it. Well, um, I will say as an Enneagram 3 I do struggle with worrying about how I am being perceived and like, am I successful and how much success is enough? And like, I want to achieve all the things I, it is something that I'm constantly having to check myself on. Um, Do you have any tips for over, like, I find myself when I'm feeling overwhelmed in that situation, I almost get like frozen and I have struggle. I struggle to make process to to move forward and make progress because mm-hmm. I'm worried about what people may think. Or even when we started the podcast, it almost was a thing for me where people are going to think, well, she's in real estate. Why is she doing something else? Why is she doing a side hustle? Or why is this happening? Um, and obviously it worked out and I'm in a good place with it. But there are times where I felt like because of imposter syndrome, like who am I to have a podcast or who am I to do this or that, that I just couldn't make progress how do you overcome like the mental block of moving forward even when you're feeling anxious about what you're doing yeah i think the the one thing that's two things here one that's critical is you got to understand when you're in that room when you're in that conversation there is something about you there is something special that's different than every single person in that room identify it lean into it the second thing i'll tell you and this is this is what the lessons i've learned from some of the biggest and best in this world uh, multi-billionaire mark Laurie and a rod this both came from them so i'm stealing their tips here but when you're feeling any bit of that anxiousness or uh like you're in a roadblock or you're scared or you're worried most people will use fear to drive their complacency and to stay and to not make the move. When you feel that, I want you to do the opposite. I want you to step into it full speed. If that anxious feeling is coming on about not talking or stepping up, step up with a crazy idea. Step right into it because all these guys have said that they have lived their life. Like when I asked Mark Laurie, there's 3,500 billionaires in the world. You came from nothing. He came from nothing. How are you one of 3,500 billionaires in the world when we have 8 billion people. Like what? How? And so what he said is like the way he lives his life is in the sixth gear. And I want to, there's some takeaways from it that we could all apply. The idea of this is the only way you're going to get more information is if you act on things. If you try a podcast, if you try to get into real estate, is if you do say something in the meeting, even though you feel uncomfortable, if you do ask for an introduction when it might not feel, you know, like uh, the best time or whatever, because every experience you have, you quickly get in more information to learn and then adapt. And so what his theory is, is that my whole life, I just went all in, all in, all in all the time I stepped into it, that I was then getting more information back. And as a result of that, I was getting more learning lessons about me and the people around me than some person might not get in four lifetimes because they were using fear as a means of not stepping into it. So all these things, go for it, try it, say it. And the second you get feedback, listen though, because you now have more information to adjust your next approach. It's the people that get the feedback and fall on their face rather than using it as constrictive, constructive opportunity to adjust what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. (laughs) That was real. I just made a ton of notes. She's feverishly (laughs) writing her notes over here. So many notes. (laughs) Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Katie. What do we mention almost every episode? Email templates. You're right. We sure do. (laughs) And after every time we mention an email template, do you know what we get? Emails asking if they can have (laughs) copies of the email template. Can you send me a copy of that template? I have never had one like that. That sounds great. And you know what the good news is? What? You can get all of our email templates from our course, Email Templates 101. Tell the people about it. Our course has all of the email templates you would need to send to your buyers and your sellers and your clients that are buying and selling at the same time. Exactly. (laughs) To get through every step of the transaction and giving them information that they need for where they are in the transaction. It's great because you never forget to tell them something. Yes. And we've already done all the work for you. We wrote them and you can personalize them. Yes. And just feel organized knowing that 
you have all the information where it needs to be. And if you purchase Email Templates 101, you do get lifetime access. So occasionally we like to go in and make updates based on the market or if we find a new best practice. So we put that right into the template and you get that updated straight away. It just goes straight to your course. Yep. Right, it's, it's just there. It's, it's already there. in there. It's just there. It's just already there. in there. You don't even have to worry about it. We'll That's send wonderful. you an email and we'll say updated. That's great. Where can so they that. find these email templates? You can find the email templates at email templates with an S 101.com. Email templates 101.com. Yes, head over for reviews and all of the specifics. Wonderful. Okay, enjoy. Uh, okay. I think that it's funny because I feel like, and that's why I've, I've always been drawn to you and vibed with what you're doing. I mean, you, to me, you're not just like a contestant off of The Bachelorette. I, what you're talking about makes sense. And what, you know, the advice you're giving is is good and carries over to lots of different people. What I want you to talk about, because you're so financially focused, um, what are some of the challenges you find that are the difference between being in the corporate world versus being an entrepreneur? Because realtors are sort of, um, what do they call that? Like reluctant entrepreneurs. They think, oh, I'm going to go be a realtor. I'm going to sell houses. And then they realize that's a small business. There's nobody that tells you how to budget, how to market, how to, nobody tells you how to, and you have to wear all the hats. And it's a lot like, I think what, what you're doing, what any entrepreneur does, they have to wear all the hats for a long time and maybe forever. What, what are some of the differences and what are maybe some of the tips or takeaways? I mean, yeah, the biggest difference is when I was working for a corporation, I would start my day thinking about how do I get through this day, right? Like, what am I going to do to check the box and meet the expectation so that I can get home quicker or go get a beer or go do something I want to do, right? When you're an entrepreneur and you find out really what is your motivating factor, like if I put you on spot right now, I say, what motivates you? And you've identified that. You've done enough self-examination to identify that. It no longer becomes, how do I get through this day and go do what I'm doing? It's literally, how do I maximize the most I can out of this 24 hours to make the greatest impact and move the chains forward for myself, my business, my life, my family more today than when I woke up this morning. Those are like the biggest factors. And the three biggest things I'll say from a financial, because you kind of touched on some of the financial pieces, the three things you have to do better than you ever did before when you're on your own. Uh, one is you have to manage debt properly. When you're in a small business and an entrepreneur, debt can absolutely crush you, but debt can be the best thing for you as you do need capital to grow in certain companies in certain areas. That's one. Two is behavioral-based budgeting. So you really have to understand where your money is going, why it's going there, and what that tells you about you. My tip for that, pull out two statements, your last two statements of your credit card uh, transactions. And for a minute, take 20 minutes, go through each line item. And rather than just looking at the dollars and the lines, try and draw some psychology out of this. Okay, I'm starting to see... All right, spending a lot at the bar, or wait a second, spending a lot on luxury goods, or wait a second, I haven't looked at you know my monthly uh, um, uh, renewable expenses. Like there is so much you can learn about yourself in literally two months of credit card transactions that can help you better understand where you're spending money, why you're spending money, and if it makes sense. And then the third thing you have to do, you know, listen, this stat is crazy: sixty-three percent of people go their entire career, not a year, not a biannual review. 63% of people go their entire career without negotiating for their packages, their salaries, and their bonuses. 63. When you are an entrepreneur, you have to negotiate everything. You have to negotiate your time. You have to negotiate where you're spending your money. You have to negotiate potential resources to grow your business. You have to negotiate percentages. It's nonstop negotiation every single second of the day. And those are the three big financial tips. And I think those are the biggest differences between entrepreneurial work and corporate work for me, at least. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So let's just say you, you did a restart. A lot of our realtor friends have mm -hmm. done or are doing a restart. When you make that leap, when you're doing that, like, what do you think is the most important stuff to do in the beginning? Like, what's the the, the base level stuff that you need to do when you go from to becoming self-employed? 
Totally. So that, I mean, that's the question. The problem is people will just make the transition without thinking through it. Um, you're going to have to adjust what you're doing in the beginning based on why you made the transition. And I think people make the transition. Uh, I think there's five big things. There's five core competencies. They either aren't getting mobility within their current career. So if you feel as though you're not accelerating at the pace you want to, whatever that may be, you then are going to have a different set of circumstances where you'll start, right? That's going to be the focus. Some people, feel as though compensation is the issue. And so that would realign their focus. Some people think it's a skill set, right? So that's going to be a totally different thing. They don't think that the, the natural skill set that they have are being utilized within their job. That'll change how they restart. Some people, it's just passion. And so making sure that you're doing the things from the get-go that are aligned with, that excite you. And something is some one of them is fear. And so if fear is the reason you haven't done what you've done, or the fear is the reason that you're just getting out of it to start, you're going to have different tactics to get things going. But it's all going to start. People try and they put it all out there everywhere, all over the internet. There's like this customized three-step process. That's not the case. There's no cookie cutter solution that's going to get your restart going. You have to really understand, and I said the word before, the bedrock, the bedrock of why you're transitioning and what you want. Based on what you've understood, what you want, you have to put a plan in place that's going to be customized to you and only you because it's going to be different for you, Katie, and it's going to be different for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, that makes sense. Okay. What is your definition of hustle. So as an entrepreneur, I think what we also struggle with is if you do find something you love and you're passionate about, then you also keep getting pulled back into it, right? So we talk a lot on our show about boundaries and actually, I mean, there's no such thing as work-life balance. But if you love what you're doing now, like let's, I assume you love what you're doing now. Do you find that sometimes you're like, ooh, I just want to get back into it. Like I want to work all day. Where where do you pick up your boundaries? Yeah, and how do you, you shut it off and, yeah. and have personal time? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> it's something I'm, I'm totally working on. And one thing that I like we're, we're starting to do is we're creating like no phone time. So if we have certain, because the phone is the biggest distraction, right, in the world. And so I think what we'll do is we'll have dinner. Caitlin and I will have dinner. We'll have, uh, you know, a game night and we'll literally just say, phones out. I have another friend who has a no phone room, which is the coolest thing. So there's a room in his house that he's like made this like extremely like cool Zen room. It's got everything him and his wife like. And when you enter that room, you can, you have to check your phone at the door. So that, that is a, that's, that's a really big one. And then I think the, the hustle question is like when you're, when you're constantly thinking uh, about your tactic and your strategy. And I think there's so many people out there that are just being order takers and not really thinking thoroughly of how they can get in front of the people they need to get in front of and how they can make the changes that they want to. And they're just, you know, if you're repeating the same things someone's doing, you're going to get very similar results. And if you're expecting different results, you're going to have to take a different approach. And that's where true hustle comes in, I think. Speaking of just maintaining like your relationship with Caitlin and your friends and family, going from just an ordinary guy working at a bank to going on The Bachelor and then making it as far as you did, at what point did you feel the difference in being like famous? Like, was it right when you, right when the show ended and people started like, so I listened to the episode you did with um, the girl who the bachelor data. Oh, I did yeah. too. The Excel yeah. where she like tracks how many followers people get <laughs> yeah. and all of this. And, and, and really you're, you were a little bit before she started tracking all of this, but I imagine like one day, did you just get on your social media and go, Oh my gosh, I have <laughs> fall. Like what, what was that transition from being ordinary banker to a celebrity still trying to go back to work to a bank, but now people know who I am. Like what, what did that even look like? That was a, a wild roller coaster, right? So, and I'll tell you that story. I I'm on my way back from the plane. I finally get my phone back and I text my boss. Uh, his name was Sean Shaw. I'm going to be back on Monday. And he's like, Oh, we're excited to have you back. Congratulations. Hope everything worked out. And that was it. And then over the weekend or on Monday morning, he's like, Hey, I got, 
got here early. I just want to let you know there's been rumors around security here that there might be paparazzi or someone like trying to get spoilers. I was like, what the hell? Like that was a I, – I'm like, excuse me? Like I – you know, this is before social media. The show aired and I was like, what the hell is going on? And then the funny thing is then my expectations like, what is happening here? But I wasn't on the show for the first six weeks. Like I was right. nowhere to be found. So then, I, then I had this like extremely like uh, humbling moment. Where I'm like, okay, this is just like, all right, cool little show. Check it off. Keep keep working. And then I had this one on one date that went really well. And uh, you know, I would say the the, the general public of, that was watching it, um, it, it really gravitated to the story. Yeah, and uh, we like him. it was relatable. Yeah. And then, you know, the next day, I go in six weeks of shows on nothing, you know, okay, I'm good. And, and you're just at day, work at this time just, while it's yeah, airing. I, while okay. it's airing, show up, up every day, show up every day. Right. And then I'm walking to work and then someone was like, Jason. And I'm like, look back, I'm like, oh, it's up. And then like two steps later, someone says, yeah. And then like four steps later, someone's like, I get a pressure. I'm like, wait a second. What? And this was just after episode six. So I was like, what? <laughs> is happening and it took a long time to like really process all that and the moment i'll never forget is it was after like i don't know becca made a comment about me being a good kisser or something and so the next day i walk I, you know I, i'm watching this and now i gotta go to work i go to work and the the admin's like oh here comes in the good kisser i'm like okay what the hell oh no <laughs> so the world's collided a little bit and um oh i don't call God. i don't like we, you know caitlin and i don't really like say like so Celebrity or famous, we just say like familiar face from you know television from a television show. And it but was can y'all go to dinner cool. without being bothered? Probably not. Uh, it just depends where you know. Okay. It just depends where. There is definitely a specific demographic that watches the show, and you could definitely go places uh, where that demographic probably wouldn't be, and you go dem- places where they will be, and you'll get, you'll, you know, you'll get a hello here. Yeah, you're like, what are we in the mood for tonight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we going to go to Broadway and go bounce by Bachelorette to Bachelorette party and say hello? Or are we going to go in the hole in the wall down the road where, uh, you know, all the, the biker bar where not one human knows about The Bachelor? <laughs> yeah. At least you have that option, I guess. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you feel like as far as humility goes and having to like – Check yourself from going from what you were to such a big success pretty quickly. I mean, how do you go from, wow, now I can afford like more house and better cars and like, how do you do that while keeping like your logical hat on and not overdoing it? I think the, the the great thing about my background is it's in finance and, you know, it's in a, like, so fi- I have an MBA in finance and accounting and I was a banker, right, for 10 years. So I understand the importance of money. I understand the statistics of bankruptcy and I totally have analyzed, you know, all the, the, the uh, statistics about bankruptcy and like professional athletes. And while our world uh, for Caitlin and I has been, we've been very fortunate in the last three, four years, Caitlin, five, six years, you just never know when that, when those things burn out and when that can end. So we live so under our income right now. Um, we just had a, a meeting with our accountant where he was, um, very, he called us both very frugal. Uh, but you know what? That puts us in a position for the rainy day next year, the year after, or when, you know, this little switch turns off. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be in a good position. And right now we are. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I think the other thing too, not just financially and, um, being humble about what you're doing, mm-hmm. but also with your ego, keeping that in check is super important. And I think whether it's reality show and you know people start calling your name overnight, or it's just someone in your community that's having a lot of success. We all I know the people when I lived in my little town in Rochester that walked around thinking they were literally, you know, they walked around like they were a multi-billionaire. They marked they walked around like they were Mark Laurie, and Mark Laurie wears sweatshirts and sweatsuits and doesn't walk around like that. I think regardless if it's like small town, I'm arrogant, or it's like A class celebrity celebrity, I think I'm untouchable. It is so important that every human checks themselves. And I think the way to do that is to make sure that like your core or your board of directors, the circles you swim in uh, are, are really good people. That's your life's work. And those people know you to the T and they're, they're going to keep you in check. And for me, for me, my family, friends, uh, and my little board of directors constantly, maybe 
overdoes it, keeps keeps us in check. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I think that was all of our main questions that we had. Yeah, for sure. Amazing. Oh, great. that was so great. It, I have so many notes. I'm just so thankful I'm, that you came. I am so humbled that you're yeah. here with us today. And it was oh just Oh my God, it's so, so much fun. Yeah, it's, so, it's so much fun to connect with you guys. And thank you for having me. And, yeah. Uh, okay, but really before you go, fun. I want you to tell us all about the book. So I know that the book is on pre-order now. So kind of walk us through. I know you've mentioned it during the show, but tell us about the book so that for everyone sure. know where they can get the book. Yeah. Okay. So you can get the book on Amazon right now, pre-order. It's the Restart Roadmap and you could uh, pre-order it now. And then once it is out, it'll be out on April 5th. You'll be able to get it at the Targets, Barnes and Nobles and things like that. But what I would say is it's a guide for anyone that's rethinking any bit of their professional track. It could be the most immaterial thing that you're rethinking, your conversations with your boss, getting along better with your colleagues, maybe working on your personal brand, or it could be is massively material, is completely changing your industry, thinking, rethinking where you live and why. Uh, this book has an eight-step roadmap to help you do that. And some of this stuff, right, there's a lot of how-to career books out there. So if someone said to me, what do you think is differentiating about this book? I would tell you, uh, one, it's entertaining. I tell, uh, it's a lot of theory, but it's theory backed by stories from behind the curtain of reality TV, some stories in Hollywood, and some uh, office experiences with what Forbes called some of the most powerful people and ranked them in banking. So from Wall Street to Hollywood, to the perspective we actually see in our homes on Main Street, there's a lot of theory, uh, stories, and every single chapter in the eight-step roadmap has specific takeaways that you can implement right now. So whether you use all eight chapters for the roadmap or you use just a few takeaways, there's definitely something uh, in this book for you. That's awesome. So did you do an audio version where you read it? I did. And let me tell you, I'm an honest guy. It sucked. It was uh, awful. What? But well, I'm, I'm, glad, sure I'm so glad I did process. it. I'm sure it was awful process. The process. Like, yes. Oh, the process. So the, like, I'm so glad I did it. And it's one of those things I'll listen back and be like, oh my God, it was worth it. But I'm also like super realistic with things. And I'm very candid and open and honest. You're sitting in this like little room and it's six hour sessions, right? And so you're reading the whole time, but it's not, you know, think about when you read a book, you read quick. Maybe you skip a couple words because you can, uh, you know, uh, just figure out what's what's your speed reading, right? This you have to go through each line and say it within the right pauses and tone increases and decreases and pullbacks. So you'll be reading the line and in your little headphone, they'll be like, "Yep, you got to reread that." Um, so you're gonna read it again. Uh, nope, we need more inflection on the. You know, to reread it again. <laughs> That's so, so tedious. It's six yeah. hours is way too long. It should be like one hour max. Oh, but you would we'll never finish. Well, well, it, yeah, took three, could... it took three sessions. We had to do three okay. sessions of that back to back. So like at the end of it, like your jaw is hurting, your neck is down. I'm just like, this sucks. Oh, I, like, no. I can't go for And then you're like really analyzing what you've written. Yeah, right, totally. Right, totally. you can't change anything oh, oh, wait, at this wait. point. That is, that is so well said because you're rereading. You're like, what the hell was I thinking with this sentence? Like, <laughs> what was like, what was going through my head? And then I'll like stop and say that. And the reader's like, hey, we're still recording. I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> wait, have you ever listened to any of Gary V's audiobooks? He No, I haven't. Goes, oh, oh my God, you have to listen to one. He uh, Listen to Crushing It or Crush okay. It. And he goes off script all of the time. And he'll be like, yeah, so book people, listen. And then he'll just, he'll change what he, like he literally will change what he wrote, but he'll keep the the, the text that he wrote. And then he'll just go off script, off script. So it's actually more beneficial to listen to the audiobook than to read the hard copy because Ooh. he is, and especially in Crushing It and Crush It, they're talking about social media. So it's always changing, right? So after yeah. he wrote it, then he's recording this audiobook a year to two years later. Wow. He's like having to update the actual, you know, like LinkedIn or whatever, like whatever he wants to talk. He's like, well, so now I'm talking about this or now I'm talking about TikTok or like, but it's wild how often he goes, as he calls it, off script. I Is love your profit that. margin different if people buy the audio version versus a hard copy? 
Um, I don't. They're st- I mean, audiobooks are expensive, so I, I didn't know if it even mattered for you. Yeah, I would. I don't think so. So I know. Okay. So it, I don't think so. Um, one of the things is with, with so I'm with Harper Collins, and how it works is you get an advance, and then with the advance, you could do whatever you want with it. You could use it for anything you want. You could just take it, and if you don't sell a copy, you still get that money. And then as you for every book that's sold audio or hardcover or paperback, a percentage goes, a big percentage goes to pay that advance back. And once they get that advance dollar back, you then make a percentage on top of whatever that is. So if I don't sell one book, I still have my advance. Uh, If I sell, I don't know, maybe it's 2000 books, maybe that number isn't hit. So I still have my advance. If I sell 5,000 books, it exceeds, you know, I'm just coming up with this time I have, but maybe that exceeds my advance. And then I start to make a percentage of every book sold after that. So you make zero until... Well, he already made the money. Right, right, right. But you're not getting any, they're not, it's not like 50-50 until you get your, until they meet it. It's like nothing until you meet it because you already got it. And then you'll start getting a paycheck. Yeah, so you sign the deal, and then the lump sum of money is ne- negotiated, right? And then how the book deal with like a big publisher like this will work is at, there's going to be certain times where a percentage of that is released. So one third of it was released when I signed the deal. Another one third of this lump sum was released when I submitted the manuscript, and the last one third was released when the manuscript got approved. So all that money then I now have. Uh, and if you, you know, I'm doing like a book tour, so there'll be expenses there and some marketing stuff. And, you know, I could do with whatever I want. But if you don't sell one book, they don't, they can't take any of that back. And then if you exceed the advance in sales, then you would get a percentage of that once that is met. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. Well, I love an audiobook, especially when it's read by the person who wrote it. I because I just want to hear it read like, by the person. Yeah, I, that's the only time mm. I can really do it. But it just makes yeah. me feel like, you know, you even know that person Well, you get better. connection there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 100%. All right. Speaking of listening to you, your podcast is so good. Yes. <laughs> um, it is called Trading Secrets. So we are obviously talking to our podcast listeners. So they're podcast people. They will go and listen. Cool. I want to tell you my favorite episode, and I have not listened to all of them. And then okay. I want you to tell me your favorite episode that you've recorded because I, what my mind was literally blown with Rob Deerdeck. Wow. I have shared that episode with so many people. Like, just the way he was hacking his life and gamifying everything and his, like, long-term vision and how he registered and thought about happiness and, you know, like, what's his spouse think and how do you feel today and how did you eat? It was just, like, literally, I, I, my mind was completely blown. Yeah. If, if you ask me what was the most life-changing episode, what was, like, the greatest impact episode, that episode literally changed my life. And I say it changed my life because even the way I operate, like how he gamifies his life is exact. I I do it every single day. I'm looking at my file right now that was created all because of that podcast. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I have 14 inputs that I put into every single day on an Excel file, uh, all because of that episode. So that one was a a life-changing episode. I'd encourage everyone to go listen to that. Uh, If you're into investing and stuff, a very eye-opening episode was we had a kid on. His name's Hugh Henney. He was a student and he became a day trader. He was making so much money that in the middle of his finance test as a senior, uh, he had look and one of his options hit and he had won. He's been or not one. He had been up seven hundred and like twenty six k for that day. And he told his bo- He told his professor, "I got to go." And his professor said to him, "If you show me that you're up to seven hundred and twenty six thousand dollars today." I'll let you go. And he showed him his P&L and he was, let him go. And he got an A and he tells his whole story. And then I would say, Um, we talked a little bit about finance today. So while there's a lot of entertaining podcasts with like different celebrities, like we had A-Rod on and some reality TV stars and like Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, a real cool one is The Points Guy. So that episode just released. And essentially, if you have a credit card, I would recommend you listen to this episode because he talks about the points that you earn on your credit card and the fact that this is literally a currency and no one, 
myself included, a guy that prides himself on finance, no one is managing their currency to the pinnacle of what they can be doing with their points. And so he has a lot of tips, tricks, and he built this business in two years. He was making 75K working at Morgan Stanley and HR. He started doing it when he was there two years after he started. Two years after he started, he exited for eight figures. And so he tells his success story and how you can really get in the game on your credit card. So uh, the points guy episode is a good one too. Wow. Have you then loved if you're being into, a podcaster? Wait, one more. If you're into okay, Netflix, tell, yeah, yeah, tell, tell us. The t- this one's good because if you're into like, suppose you're like, I'm not into the finance stuff, but you're into like current pop culture relevancy uh, and money, the Tinder swindler. We had one of the girls on from oh. the Tinder swindler and she tells the whole story of how she got taken for 300K. And if you've ever been taken or you're trying to teach someone that needs to cross their T's and dot their I's, there are a lot of lessons from her, from her vantage point. Mm. Wild. This was... Do you love podcasting? I love it. I love it. It's great. You just never know what you're going to learn. You You never know know what you're going to learn and who you can connect with. And if you're a talker, which you're obviously a talker, we're obviously (laughs) talkers because mostly we just talk to each other. So Mm -hmm. our podcast, we only have a guest maybe on every fourth or fifth episode and the rest of them are are us talking to each other. Oh, cool. Uh, But it's just so fun. So fun. So you guys need to go listen to Trading Secrets because it's really, really good. And for like the Bachelor fans and reality TV, I like that you actually actually go into the logistics of what did we get paid to go on The Bachelor? How does that work with real life? Like, what does this look like? Nick Vile's episode of yours was excellent. That was so good. We got into it on that one. That was all behind the scenes of The Bachelor. (laughs) So good. My only comment on The Bachelor, and then we can ask for his toast. Okay, perfect. Who you would like to toast because we end each episode with our -hmm. our toasting. But I felt like Caitlin was such a good host of The Bachelor because, Mm -hmm. or The Bachelorette, because she was very involved and added value to the show, like Chris Harrison did. And I think that this year, I mean, it was. Are you about to dog on Jesse? (laughs) Well, I feel like he didn't have a lot of direction as far as like, you didn't see him a lot. He, like, Caitlin was on screen a good bit when she was the host, he wasn't really present. And so then he would randomly show up and I'd be like, oh, yeah, there's mm-hmm. like that's the guy. someone supposed to be helping. But I feel like it, it should be more of the host's job to say, hey, this actually is happening when you're not around. Yeah, I like, want to see that, too. It made me sad that The Bachelor and Bachelorettes always have to wait until it airs to see what was going on when the camera crew and everybody else sees it in real time and knows that Clayton's getting played or this person really is not a good person, but they don't have any heads up until they watch it back when maybe the whole point of having the host would be to say, hey, oh, this is you happening. Know what a great analogy that is. Jeff Probst does insert himself into Survivor. Not, I mean, only yeah. in the, in the um, what you call it, in Tribal Council, but he actually will kind of like steer the conversation so that things will come out or he knows things and you can so yeah. he'll ask pointed questions but mm-hmm. you're right in the bachelor they don't well i feel like caitlin could actually give advice oh i like it. and yeah. and, mm-hmm. and guidance and direction yeah and this it was just kind of lacking so maybe anyway you can just tell her she did a wonderful job and my <laughs> grandmother my grandmother loves her and loves dancing with the stars and all oh, of that cool. so she's a big fan big fan huge I fan will for and, sure and i will pass the message that's awesome i think she did a great job too so i'm on i'm on she board really with did. everything you said i'm in we're we're in agreement there and i'll pass mm-hmm. the message for sure love it and now i will digress okay great do you have a <laughs> do you have a toast Yes, actually, I think that's a perfect uh, transition. So I, if I'm going to toast, I would toast. Uh, well, I have a little bubbly sparkling water. I kind of wish it was real sparkling wine, but we got to oh, keep yeah. working. Uh, mm-hmm. But my toast, and I'll maybe I'll get a little spade sparrow tonight, would be actually to Caitlin. So it's this week, and this is why. It's this week she finishes uh, Dancing with the Stars tour. So she's been on tour with them for two and a half months. Her last show is March 16th in LA. And I think uh, the coolest thing about that, if if someone could take away any lesson from it, is that her whole entire kind of life, she was told she'll never, she doesn't have the skill set uh, to dance professionally, and so she was cut and cut and cut, and so she had to take uh, a detour. But while taking detours, she always 
talked about this dream and put it out there because when you talk about it, people will help you get to where you want to get. And so in a wild set of circumstances, there's never been someone from the show of The Bachelor that went on Dancing with the Stars five years or so after they were on the show. Uh, Caitlin got on the show, won the show, and as a result of winning, has now been on tour for uh, two and a half months, literally living the dream that forever she was told there's no shot. And so if you continue to put your dreams out, there. Uh, one, you can manifest it. And two, you'll be surprised at who will, will hear that, pick up on it and, and find a way to help you out. That's I love awesome. It. Jury- Cheers to Caitlin. Cheers to there Caitlin. What a success story. <laughs> so how often story. in the last two and a half months while she's been on tour, have y'all been able to see each other? Um, I've, I've been to four shows now. So each one of those okay. four shows I've been to. And then there was one time she was close to Nashville and able to come back. So five, five different occasions. That's and then uh, yeah. I'll months. see her next mm-hmm. week for the last show too. So six or seven That's different good. occasions. Not too bad. Then yeah. you can get back to wedding planning. Exactly. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> I like it. Well, thank you. This has just been wonderful. Yeah. Okay. You're yeah. blurry, so I don't really want to take a picture, but we're going to oh. take a picture anyway. Okay. Well, I sent you one. I, I'll send you oh, good. one. Maybe oh, yours good. Yeah. Good. We'll see how that one right, goes let's, too. Let's, we'll take this one. Okay. Smile. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> okay. Cool. Perfect. Oh, awesome. oh, that's, oh, yeah. Good. It does look good. It's oh, great. Perfect. Amazing. Okay. Jason, really, this was huge for us and we really, really appreciate you. And it was so fun and we can't wait for our audience to hear it. It will air, um, I think March 28th. So cool. this month, Amazing. like the end of the month. Um, okay, but cool. thank you. Yes. Thank you so my much. Pleasure. Let, let us know when it all comes out and um, keep in touch and we'll probably see you at the next happy. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Hustle Humbly podcast. Let us know who we should toast to for the next episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Hustle Humbly Podcast. If you have an episode, topic, or question, please email us at hustlehumblypodcast at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. See you next week. Bye. This is the good life. Make your excited face. <laughs> Scarlet, blah 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 blahs. Okay, can you guys talk? I just changed this. Yes, we'll just talk and talk and talk until you until okay, you can hear us. us. <laughs> there we go. Now I got gotcha. you. I am so what a mess. I was ten minutes late, and then we I asked for the link, and my one person on my team's in the air, and the other person didn't have it. So I deeply apologize. No, it's fine. You're fine. And look at you with your snazzy new haircut. Yeah, I got a short, you yeah. know, I'm doing it up. <laughs> very, very good. Very good. Well, we're yeah. very, very, very excited to have you here, but we're gonna kick our dog out now and close the door. So I thanks, love Jay. It. You know, I got I got this because I have the two dogs at my feet. This is the red can. If they see this when Caitlin and I are podcasting, they know like don't that's talk it? no more. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Now I wonder why you're are we clear to you? Cause your like video is blurry. Oh really? Um that's interesting. So on my side, my video is crystal clear. Um okay. actually, in fact, you guys look a little blurry. So I'm wondering why don't we try this? Hey, Jay, the video is blurry. Yeah, it's going to be. It won't look like that. Yeah. I oh, he funny. says it's going to be, but it won't look like that afterwards. Oh, okay. I'll, yeah, That's I'll interesting. Even, I'll, I'll send, I'm going to send you a, a picture here <laughs> of, uh, of kind of so you can get an idea. I'll, I'll send it in the email. Perfect. So it gives you an idea of like uh, the clarity of at least what I'm seeing. Hopefully that's what comes through. So my husband does our podcast editing. And he was wow. like, Zoom is not good enough recording. He's like, the recording quality isn't good enough. So we're trying out this software for the first time. Yes. And I've used this. Like a lot of uh, podcasting networks actually use Riverside. And it's great. Okay. I've never had an issue with it. Oh, good. Okay. Well, yeah, that's good to hear. it's definitely better than Zoom. Perfect. Okay. So we are recording and we do share the video on YouTube. Not cool. that you're going to do anything crazy, but just so you're aware. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. I love it. Okay, so should we fangirl first? Because we're both Bachelor franchise fans. And then we can get into the real stuff. So (laughs) Katie is in your group. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. My yeah. name's Alyssa. Yeah. So this is Alyssa. Hey. <laughs> nice to meet you, Alyssa. <laughs> I'm an equal fan. And um, oh. me and Katie always discuss The Bachelor and, and follow Bachelor Nation and whatnot. So 
Yeah, we're not crazy yeah. people. We're, we're totally <laughs> No, yeah. I know Katie. We've talked all about her NFTs and her businesses. Yeah. So we go way yeah. back. But uh, yeah, okay, it's always back. good to meet. That's right. So meet. we're My so mom glad. is from Bachelor Nation and Caitlin's mom is from Bachelor Nation. So it's all, we're all in the family here. Caitlin is by far my favorite. You got very lucky because she's a gem of a human. Like that's Shh. just... She's so she, great. She is a gem of a human, and I did get lucky. You are so, so right about that. She is really a special person, and I always tell her there are no two Caitlin Bristows in the world, and that can't be said about everybody. No, <laughs> there no, are not. No. Okay, so we know your time is valuable. We won't dig into any more Bachelor stuff. Um, but we're really excited because I think what you teach and what um, you do lines up with our audience. So mm -hmm. it's not just that we're fans, it's that it also makes sense sense. Um, yeah. So I need to figure out what episode we're on because I'm going to introduce you and then we're just going to go with the flow. Amazing. Okay. So, oh, you're number 138. And I don't know how much you know about the Hustle Humbly podcast, but we started over two years ago and Katie and I are some of the top producing agents in our marketplace in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Cool. And so, but we felt like we operated differently than a lot of the other agents. We didn't really go off of like the competitive vibe. Like we were always mm -hmm. very, you know, community over competition and we were with different companies. And so we did a transaction together and I thought this is so refreshing to find an agent that kind of works the same way I do. And we just became friends and we've been doing the podcast now every Monday for over two over years. two years, and mm -hmm. um, it's just grown and grown, and we've really enjoyed it. And so we are hustle humbly because we do believe in working hard while also keeping like a humble spirit despite the success that you have. Yeah, which is not you know there's not a lot of humility in the real estate world. <laughs> it's very right. flashy. Like look at me, look at my billboard oh. and my nice car and my watch, <laughs> and and we just aren't really that way. No. Yeah. Um, I love that. And so that's, that's kind of like the listeners that we have are attracted yeah, to that. I mean, we have, well, obviously real estate is predominantly a female, you know, industry and your audience is predominantly female. Our audience is 100% almost, I mean, almost, we have some guys, we do have some guys but, but it's mostly yeah. a female audience. So if that gives you any context. Yeah. Um, Wait, that's interesting to me. So real estate is predominantly female based? Yeah. Especially female. residential real estate, commercial real estate would then skew way okay. male. Interesting. But, it, but just generally licensed people, it's it's way more female. Oh, mm -hmm. fascinating. Okay, cool. That's amazing. Yeah. And I remember Katie telling me about the podcast and the success on one of our like happy hours. And I think that's, I think you talk, talking about it, the success and monetization and the growth is kind of like what sparked even this interview. So that's so exciting you guys are doing that. Yeah. It's very cool. I'm going to turn you up some because I feel like, oh, that's as loud okay. as it gets. Okay, I fine. Can, you can hear good? Okay, good. All right. All right. So this is it. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Love it. All right. So 